hey guys how's it going welcome back so today we're going to be looking at fraud account detection so we know that uh, tech companies like facebook linkedin they all operate at the very large scale right so these companies have over like millions and millions of users so it can be difficult to really track uh, fraud account or abusive activities on their platform. So we're going to take an approach of machine learning and try to see how machine learning can actually solve this problem. So I've read a couple of papers from Facebook and how they using deep learning to solve this problem. So I'll actually be kind of like walking through you through all of their techniques. I think this will be more like a, a series whereby we're going to look at we're going to start with Facebook, then we're going to go to LinkedIn and I'm going to check also Uber uh, blogs. So before we start, I just want to take you towards an example of um, an abusive uh, activity that happened on Uber. I really came across this uh, blog, which I quite uh, like. So um, this gentleman here wrote a beautiful blog whereby he kind of like... Uh, his account his uber account was was uh was hacked and he was locked outside of uber account so then the person who hacked this account essentially made multiple uh orders uh and these orders like they happen at the at the very like very fast right meaning that each order maybe took like uh he ordered many orders like in few few timelines something like that right so uh one thing one key takeaways from from this uh block that actually caught my eyes was that like sometimes keeping things simple can really be powerful right so uh this was uber engineering at the time so i've never went through this into too much detail uh what i can see is uh what i can see is that he kind of like made a uh, general uh advices or suggestion to uber engineering so his advice was that like sometimes rules can actually beat machine learning for example if like you kind of like have orders that are happening like in like uh let's say less than five minutes you have like someone made like 10 orders or something like that right so that doesn't make sense for someone to make 10 orders in like short period of time and it could be that that is also not my usual behavior as a user right so I've, i wouldn't like order certain food uh because i don't usually order those food right maybe i eat certain food so those kind of like easy rules uh they can actually take us very far because also the heuristic they are very fast to compute um so like the latency there is very low. So also like having uh, heuristics and having machine learning behind, then that is that is a very good uh, architecture because now you know that actually machine learning is going to be able to detect these complex uh, non-linearity uh, features whereby, you know, we have complex advisories, something like that. Then machine learning is going to be detect that. But something easy like uh, multiple orders occurring at the same time, then essentially uh, rules can actually also detect that, right? For me personally, I really like Uber engineering. I feel like I always read their blogs. I feel like they have a great uh, Uber engineering team. So I will actually try to also cover their how they they do fraud. But it looks like this this article could have been an old article because I can see that they were using LSTM encoding model. So I've never went through this. I just read this article. Anyway, let's look at YouTube, right? So. Also on YouTube recently, um, it looks like uh, I came to uh, towards many tweets whereby people were also complaining about uh, comments which were spam on YouTube, and it's like they were getting out of hands. And we can see that like uh, you you watch this video, and this video is quite different from from uh, let's say uh, the, the title here. Someone said my new Las Vegas home tower, and you get these comments which are irrelevant from the from the title right and these 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 are like bots because every time someone posts a new video then they kind of like they these these bots like they 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 um they start like commenting very fast and they have a lot of likes so it shows that like there's so many bots like on these platforms right so so uh but but today we're gonna take um we're gonna look at facebook and see how facebook actually uh deals with advisories Okay, cool. So 
essentially facebook introduced um deck so they called it uh deep entity uh classification so one of the motivation between uh uh, establishing DAG was that engineered features do not scale very well, right? Uh, they can be tuned to overfitting uh, and they can be hard to maintain and advisories also can be easily can easily adapt between these uh, engineered features, right? So by engineered features, I mean if the model um, relies on age to detect if like this account is a fraud or something like that then the attacker on the platform can easily change their age right so can easily change their age so another reason it could be because of rules so rules do not scale very well imagine if you had to write rules that okay if this account has the uh, has this post or it is sending this post or it is coming from this country or something like that then that means you're gonna have to write over a million of of uh of rules right because we know that facebook is has a lot of lot of interaction between the users so users interact differently advisories come up with new ways they can actually spam accounts or they can be abusive or on the platform right so another another reason we can look at is reviewing manually if just imagine if like a human has to go through all the posts and they try to look at each post and try to figure out if this that post actually um uh, a fake account is coming from a fake account or it is abusive or something like that so that might also not be good okay so so we needed something that is more complex that can actually capture interaction between these users right uh, and by that then it's gonna make it difficult for the advisories to invade these attacks man these models so um especially in the in the banking sector whereby they were heavily invested in the logistic regression so you can think of these as traditional machine learning so traditional machine learning uh, relied heavily on um engineered features this could be including location age and friends right however these models also they can't capture non-linearity between these uh, features so complex interaction between these features they can not capture that so that actually makes these model not that complex to capture these uh complex ways in which these attackers are coming up with new ways to kind of like be abusive on the platform right so that then led to facebook coming up with the new uh solution called facebook deep entity uh classification which we're gonna discuss in them in short now but the idea behind this uh model was that we wanted to kind of like come up with features uh, whereby we can actually be able to track how these users um, are kind of like engaging on the platform or uh, right so you can think of like we're creating embeddings in a social graph right so by doing this then we know that these users it is going to be hard for them to kind of like uh, not be caught because we know that okay the users that kind of like send i'm just making an example here so users that send let's say multiple requests to different people and they're getting rejected right so this is an action that they take so we can be able to see that okay users that does this they're getting rejected and they kind of like um they are a fraud account or something like that right then we're gonna detect them as fraud because it's unusual for someone who does not know people and immediately just send start sending a lot of requests right so so this is gonna be um as uh, classified as a, as a as a bad account so um so how does this facebook do this so now i'm still giving you a high level overview so we're gonna get into too much detail into everything okay so essentially it has to extract deep features so by deep features i'm talking about both uh the direct features so direct features include things such as um uh, ages and we have behavioral features uh and we have also the deep features right so the deep features could be also like uh or behavioral features could be also we're talking about how many number of accounts uh this users is following or something like that so uh, 
but by doing uh, deep features whereby we try to like understand the sequence of actions these users are taking so this brings us to over like uh, 20,000 of features uh, so it's a very high dimensional uh, data that we get by doing uh, by extracting data in a in this fashion okay so I'm gonna get into too much detail into everything for now I'm still kind of like giving you an overview of this so we have uh, Facebook also have a labeling system. So I'm just going to get into this one into more detail. So Facebook uses a multitask um, uh, of high precision and low precision label. So what I'm saying here is that they have assigned human to kind of like, because they are using um, a supervised model whereby they have an account and they have associated labels associated with those count. So now they need humans to actually review um, abusive account or fake account, so to speak, right? But now the problem is that humans cannot scale, right? Imagine if you're gonna have a human to kind of like go through these accounts. So it's gonna be tedious. It's very slow process, right? So Facebook, essentially they came up with another technique whereby they're gonna rely on human uh, labeling. At the same time, they're gonna rely on uh, like heuristic right so in the paper they never actually got into too much detail explaining how the rules um of assigning these 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 account works but one thing i know that they did mention was that they're using rules to kind of like get um these these uh spamming accounts so i i uh it, it's a very fast uh um model that they have in place uh, it's just based on rules. It could be baby because of maybe five account were created with the same IP address or something along those lines. But the the one thing that that you should take from this is that these these low, uh, heuristic essentially create a low precision. By low precision is that they are not necessarily accurate compared to human reviewing uh, labels, but the Facebook have been using this to kind of like detect abusive accounts. So. The advantage here is that you can have over like 2 billion accounts that are being uh, flagged as um, as fake or something like that, right? So you have, it's very, very efficient in terms of getting more uh, fake account. Whereas with human, it's slow, but it's more accurate. So that's the trade-off. That's why they decided to go with um, um, human and uh, uh, low precision uh, um uh, labeling system, right? So just a quick crash course, right? So uh, we have different labeling techniques. It could be that we have a learning, uh, transfer learning, so to speak, whereby we have uh, a model that has already been trained. And what you do is that you then do, um, you, you can do your feed forward uh, at, uh, on that neural network and you just kind of like train on the task itself because of already have all the features uh, feature maps that have already been trained if you're doing something like CNN. You can also look at something like weak uh, uh, labeling, whereby you kind of like have, as a starting point, you kind of like have heuristics, right? Then you make assumptions based on these heuristics. Then uh, as you kind of like have more data, then you can like train your models based on those heuristics. The second one that we can look at is called semi-labeling. So semi-labeling essentially, uh, you can have a machine learning model whereby, because you have initially you have few labels which are accurate, uh, then those labels, you, you train a machine learning models, then it makes predictions the, uh, on the data points whereby it makes uh, it makes predictions with high probabilities, then you're gonna use that as your input data, if that makes sense, right? So, but but as for Facebook, they decided to use uh, this this technique whereby they have humans and they have um, also uh, heuristics on the side, right? So what are the challenges so far uh, with this with this approach, right? So because we said like they have over like 2,000, we know that they have 20,000, I mean to say, of features, right? So this is a very high dimensional data. So it's very complex. So it can be prone to overfitting, especially also the feature space require large training because you have a lot of features. So it's gonna take a lot of, um, a lot of computational resources. So 
so far these are the challenges that uh, they might be faced. So essentially these challenges motivated uh, Facebook to kind of like design this multi-stage and multi-task learning uh, 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 model, right? So like I said, it uses the low precision label data. So the low precision label data, let's think of it as, although we are still gonna get into too much detail into this, but we can think of it as like we have a sample of data and we have we have all the labels that we got from heuristics. So here we have like a lot of data, right? So this data is gonna go through um, a deep learning uh, neural networks, right? So we have um, a set of labels inside there. It could be like spam, uh, it could be compromised, it could be a uh, fake or something like that. Then we have a three layered uh, neural network, which we're gonna take all of these uh, inputs inside there. Right. So the goal of this essentially is to squeeze because of like, like I said, the problem here was that we have 20,000 of inputs. So it's kind of like squeeze these inputs into a lower dimensional um, embeddings, so to speak. Right. Then after we have done with lower dimensional embeddings, then we're going to match this into into a high precision uh this is like you can think of this as the stock on state i'm gonna get into this into uh more details just giving you a high level overview as of now okay so how is this actually used from facebook perspective uh let me just zoom in here a little bit so is this used uh from facebook in production so essentially the user will then make uh let's say they will make an action on facebook so if they make an action, essentially that action will then go into the data set uh, if that dates the, if that action has been triggered as a, a fraud or something like that, it'll go into a data set. It'll go inside here. If not, then that those actions will become raw features whereby they will then be aggregated. They'll also be fed into into a, a machine learning model. By aggregated features, I mean we try to aggregate okay on average something like on average how many users um how many accounts does this user follow right what's the mean average for this account right for something like that so we're just doing like all of these um uh we just like aggregating the features for for uh, for, for these users right so if we find out the user uh, has been detected as abusive, right? If the Facebook account, the model that is in production kind of like detect this as abusive, then there's gonna be enforcement based on like whether the user want to appeal for the, for the account, then we're gonna have a human reviewer. So the human reviewer will have to decide if this um, it's a fake account or not. And this actually helps the model because if it was if it was a false positive, then the model, the human reviewer can actually fix it and put this data into the more training data set. So the model can kind of like fix itself. So it's more like a loop whereby if the model fixes it itself, there's still a way in which we can try to like feed uh, the, the incorrect predictions into the training data set. Okay, guys. So I hope you're still with me. Uh, we're going to get into too much details and just giving you also high level overview of everything at this point. So, uh, like I initially said, uh, uh, I'm going to explain everything here. Just apologies for my horrible uh, handwriting. Um, so what do, we, what do we have here is that we have a different set of features, which are then these features here, uh, Facebook, they define as entity types, right? So this include things such as account age, just like we define in the first, uh, first part. So it could include things such as IP addresses. And then we also have features such as we call them as direct features. So this could include such as average ages. Uh, it could include average group join, something like that, right? So these are more like aggregated features. So um, they're quite powerful and we're gonna get into why these features are very powerful and and why we have to have aggregated features. 
right? So aggregated features, essentially, they can be quite hard to manipulate, whereas these features, they are very easy to manipulate, right? We know that the user can easily change their, their address, uh, IP address. They can use a different mobile device. Users can change their age. So those are uh, those are features are easily to manipulate. However, these direct features um, can be quite hard. Even if the user tried to manipulate them, um, they can still be hard to manipulate, right? It's because you have the mean average age of like the person that uh, you're following, right? The people that you're following. So how, how is like these models then implemented in production, right? So the implementation of DAG, essentially you can think of it as we have a graph whereby, you know, this is the target user. So this is the main focus. Then these are like all the uh, edges and all the entities. Entities are all these accounts that this user is connected to. Uh, right. So you can see this is more like a graph, right? So how we extract features is that we traverse through the graph, uh, then, or then we, we can like traverse through the graph and we get the features, right? However, Facebook, how they do it, they do it in a very uh, good way because you can imagine that if we were about to go to each user and we traverse each 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 user like we go through these um these uh these edges and we try to kind of like get their age you know it's going to be competitionally like <laughs> expensive you can think about it it's going to be way 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 too competitionally expensive right so instead what facebook does uh which i'm going to take you to there is that uh facebook essentially uses uh, a trigger to call to kind of like know when to kind of like go and to extract the features right so they call this as a cool down problem so they can have um a specific set of time to say okay after this specific time then go and extract the the, the features so the assumption is that the users that have already been on facebook for quite some time they are highly li unlikely for those to be a uh, fake account so it could be that they focus mainly on also on um on a newly created account but the bottom line from this is that they avoiding like all the time if like the user post or do something then they have to extract that no they don't do that because that is going to be completely expensive so they kind of like have a trigger uh, when to do to kind of like traverse through the graph and get all of these interactions of the users okay so they also like say that they restrict the graph traversal for the account with many connection so we can think of like some of the users like they have like a lot of lot of connections right so let's say a user has over like 1 million followers on 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 facebook so we can't necessarily go to each um, user. Maybe we can like have to select a few to traverse that. Another thing that they do in production is that they cache the production, they cache the, the connections of these users so that they don't have to like kind of like traverse through each graph all the time. So that can also be cached and it can be reused in production. However, they say that the time is also quite important, so they wouldn't rely on the cached, uh, cached data. They will have to uh, 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 recompute it if necessary. Okay, so that's how they, they kind of like try to solve this problem of like traversing and try to see like each user's interaction with other users, right? So otherwise, if they did that, it was going to be uh, computerly uh, expensive. So why are we doing this why are we kind of like aggregating the aggregating the, the the features right like we spoke about uh i think it was on this part whereby we spoke about direct features so are we doing that so one way i can think of this is that aggregated features are quite powerful thinking of like if you can get the mean then you can reduce your dimensional space because you know instead of getting all the mean uh or the age of all the users he said if you get the mean then you reduce the dimensional space of training the data right so this is can very 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 uh be helpful right so you can do something like on average how many how many friends does the user has or on average how many how many groups did the user join 
um, or the mean, yeah, on average, something like that, right? So also they say in the paper that they're using categorical features, they aggregate them statistically. So they never actually specified how they do this. So my assumption was that because of we working with categorical value, uh, features, such as country, they could be probably using uh, something like mean encoding, whereby they encode this based on the target, or um, they could be hashing these uh, these features, right? They could be hashing them uh, or something like that, using hashing tricks. That was my assumption, but that is another way of like, they can reduce uh, high dimensional space because that's the purpose. Uh, they observe both numerical and categorical features. So they try to uh, sub do something along the lines of uh, cross features, right? Whereby they try to think of ways they can easily uh, create one feature from numerical and categorical features, which is quite good, actually. So, like I said, aggregating features, the main goal is that it reduces the dense features in space. So you you had like you have like a lot of features. Instead of having all of those age, you kind of like have the mean. So that is actually easy to compute um, and it actually resistant towards advisory adoption. Okay. So let's look at the feature selections and what kind of features that they went with all right so uh initially they had uh direct features uh so direct features essentially uh mean that what is the behavior of the user on the platform so right the user liked this the user had a la had a link or the user had a link the user the like count or something like that then the entity type refers to things such as user groups or uh, something like that the deep entities uh these are the ones that like kind of like you have to kind of like get through uh try visiting through the graph so it could be users in a photo or post or something like that so However, there's a key thing that you have to understand is that if we use these direct features, they can be actually, they can actually lead the model to overfit, right? Because direct features, essentially, if a post has a link, then the model can easily assume that this uh, post is what it was posted by a fake account, right? So because we know that most of like fake accounts they tend to like spam people they send like a lot of emails or send like posts they always have links inside them so it is actually not good so to kind of like rely on these direct features alone okay so this is the interesting part for me about the paper is that how do they actually do uh, modifying features in production this is quite important because now the model is in production, but what if we want to add a new feature, right? How do we then update that product, uh, the model that is in production um, uh, in such a way that we change the feature because we can't change the feature in production because we're gonna like break the model, right? However, the Facebook, they do something quite interesting. They call like, uh, they split the feature login pipeline whereby they have experimental in production. So by this, it means that experimental, they can add as features and remove features as they want, right? Whereas the current model is still in production. So after they have tested this uh, rigorously uh, in, in, in uh, offline, and they think this model will do well, then they just gonna replace the one that is in production with this experimental model. So this one will be actually become production. Right, so which is quite cool. So now we're gonna get into the modeling part of um, how Facebook was actually able to model this uh, uh, deck that I know deep entity classification. So this actually will help you to kind of like understand. So what happened is that we have two faces, kind of like give you an overview at the high level, what I'm talking about. So we have two faces, we have stage one and we have stage two. So you can think of stage one as the stage of low pros, uh, low precision. So we have attained this, these accounts 
uh, from from heuristic. So this 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 is working fine. It's very efficient. It can give us like a lot of data that we can get all the spam or fake account or something like that, right? So this is very good. Uh, Facebook has been using this for years, and uh, it's very efficient. It's not so accurate, but it's very efficient because we can get as many fake account as possible. Okay. Because of on this, we have we have over like 20 um 20,000 of um of features so it's a very high dimensional features what facebook does is that it then create a three layer um deep neural network whereby they take all of these features and they pass them as input layers and they make sure that they normalize this uh using a box cox the input layers will then be forwarded towards a hidden layer and we're going to get the output layer so the output layers are the predicted um uh are the predicted uh labels like such as spam however we don't necessarily care about the output the only thing that they use in the second stage is this hidden layer uh, i made this to be huge actually it's supposed to be uh very little because this is a lower dimensional uh vector um and embedding so to speak which is actually going to be used in the second stage as input. So then Facebook take this uh, as an Im this embedding, which is lower dimensional. So it's no longer 20,000 20, features or more, or something like that. On the second stage, this is where we call uh, a high precision, a high precision stage, right? Because this data here or these accounts have been labeled by humans, right? They could be less than 300,000. So, however, they're very accurate. It's just that we have few data, but they're very, way, way, way too accurate. So what we do in this case is that we train these embeddings through um, a traditional machine learning model like gradient boosting trees. Uh, then it makes the predictions. This is going along with the stage two, which is human label data, right? then we kind of like have all of these predictions inside here, right? So we can see that they still use um, decision trees um, or uh, gradient descent trees in production because these have low latency. So that's why they, they didn't go for deep learning models, which I think it was a good idea given the computational expensive uh, of the of the architecture itself since we need to kind of like how we're getting the data right cool so we're gonna go to the evaluation so the results are quite impressive on the overall performance of the architecture so facebook what they did is that they tried different um uh, uh, different ways to test the model. So they started with behavioral. So behavioral include like uh, features such as number of, of friends. So you can think of this, which is taking all of these behavioral features. Then we pass them towards um, gradient uh, boosting trees and we just like try to get our predictions. So these include only direct features only, right? Then we have a deck. So this does not include uh, the um gradient boosting trees it only include uh the the neural network only so this components here only include neural networks so based on the roc that they have evaluated these models uh these two models whereby they've trained um they train a neural network and they've trained a neural network and sg boost combined like you know the the multi-stage uh uh, the one that I just showed you, it was actually 20 times uh, more uh, better compared to behavioral. So which kind of like shows the power of deep learning, whereby it can actually capture all of these complex um, R features and how these features interact with one another. Right. However, Facebook, they did mention that, you know, uh, ROC essentially it's not good. Uh, metric especially if we have unbalanced data it can be a little bit biased which uh then the option for precision and recall um uh metric which then they were able to see that actually the multi 
multi-stage model was able to obtain over 0.95 on precision and it is actually it was able to also maintain a high uh, recall so which was good right so for, for my key takeaways from this guys i'll say like what one bottleneck that uh after reading this since i'm a machine learning engineer i usually look at <laughs> i usually look at like production side of things uh so the system essentially matches like um 0 0.7 of global cpu of facebook so this this like architecture that we just discussed is way 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 too computationally expensive so however facebook or they were able to actually uh, deployed it in production mainly because it, it 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 actually reduced a lot of global CPUs because it was able to detect uh, all of these fake accounts. So it was more like a win-win situation whereby the model itself it had like high, um, it was computer expensive, but because of also it reduced more account which were becoming were taking a lot of CPUs from uh, Facebook, then it kind of like well, it was actually accepted. So it was fine. So interpretability also is quite um, an, uh, a bottleneck because the model now could not be interpreted, especially when on the neural network part. So uh, we still working on this in the community, trying to create models which are easily to interpret, right? Especially because users, some users might actually want to understand why the account where were detected as fraud, they might want reasons or something like that. So it's actually kind of like good to have this interpretability. So yeah, guys, that will do it for me. I'll make sure that I discuss the LinkedIn approach. Um, I'll share the paper with you guys for your um, convenience and I'll show all the resources that I have with you so that you can go through this. It was quite an interesting paper and I'll actually cover more of these uh, fraud account detections. See you in the next video. Thanks.